Welcome to the Nightly News Podcast. This is Professor Paul Miller on a special edition of the Nightly News Podcast. Today, hosted by Nightly News Secretary Xi Pinthong. We also welcome into the studio Counselor Megan Klein and Title IX Coordinator Megan Peterson. On the show today, we will be talking about Cy's recent project with uh, some of the different organizations here at Central Penn College in creating a sexual assault PSA. And Megan Klein and Megan Peterson will spend the next two segments speaking more about sexual assault all over the United States on college campuses and other things in the news. So, take it away, Cy. Hello, Central Penn. This is Sadiou Pinthong from the Nasir Harris Podcast Studio here at Central Penn College. Today, I'm joined with Megan Peterson, Title IX officer and ADA coordinator, and Megan Klein, counselor here at Central Penn College. Hey, folks. Hello. Thanks for having us. Um, Ms. Peterson, could you tell us a little bit about your background? Sure. Um, I have a background of almost nine years of experience in higher education and student affairs. Um, I started out in residence life, um, worked in residence life for a while, um, and got really passionate about Title IX um, and the gender equity laws that go along with that. Um, And so now I'm in the position of Title IX officer and ADA coordinator, so I'm working with students through Title IX issues and also with any students who need um, accommodations as a result of a disability. And how about you, Ms. Klein? Yes, so I actually interned here out of grad school. I did my final spring internship here. So I started out as an intern and then actually had the summer off, was working a different job, and then came back here and started working full-time as the one and only counselor. So my background is in social work. I have my master's in social work and my clinical license in social work too. And I've been here for going on four years now. Um, Today, we're going to talk about sexual assault and sexual harassment. With the current social issues that's going on with sexual assault and sexual harassment, I felt it important to bring it up. We created a PSA about sexual harassment and uh, I'd like to talk to you both, because you guys are the subject matter experts here on Central Penn, about the issue at hand. Okay. Um, first of all, I would like to hear what's the definition of sexual assault versus sexual harassment? Sure. I mean, when we're talking about sexual misconduct, it's really a continuum of behaviors that um, can really range in their severity. Um, so sexual assault is a, obviously the most extreme end of that continuum, um, and it can include non-consensual intercourse, which is what we commonly know as rape. Um, but it can also include non-consensual sexual contact. Um, and both of those are considered forcible sex crimes, and I'll get into what that means a little bit later. But non-consensual sexual contact could also include um, improper touching, um, the non-consensual removal of someone's clothing, um, or sexual exploitation, which could be anything from going on the boundaries that were established of consent in an encounter, or non-consensual video or audio taping of sexual contact, or even giving someone um, an STD that you know that you had that you didn't disclose your status to that person. So that's on the sexual assault end of the continuum. And then sexual harassment, um, which is also on that continuum, is any unwanted visual, verbal, or physical conduct of a sexual nature. Um, So it's anything that's creating an intimidating, hostile, or offensive working, educational, or living environment. Like the sexual misconduct continuum, sexual harassment is also a continuum that can encompass a whole lot of behaviors. Some more common examples could include um, displaying pornographic material, making inappropriate jokes. It can also mean making sexual romantic advances towards someone and persisting after that person's told you to stop, um, and can even include inappropriate physical contact, contact with someone. So those are kind of the difference between sexual assault versus sexual harassment when we're talking about that continuum of sexual misconduct. Ms. Klein, is there anything else you want to add to that? Nope, she hit it right on the head. Okay. With the different agencies that both of you uh, represent, which are very important here for the students and the staff of uh, Central Penn College, um, I will start with uh, you, Ms. Peterson. Could you tell us the process, lead us through the process of a victim or a person inquiring about probable possible sexual assault. Sure. If a student um, is coming to my office um, to talk about 
potential sexual assault, I can kind of walk them through what that reporting process looks like. Any reports that come to my office, I have an obligation to at least look into to make sure that there's kind of some background there and to do at least a preliminary investigation. Now, if the student coming forward doesn't want a full investigation, maybe they just want some support services, they don't want um, the issue that they're bringing forward to go to um, disciplinary action or to a hearing, I can work with that student to establish support services. Um, maybe they need to create separation between themselves and someone else on campus. I can work with a safety plan um, with a student to do that. Um, or if a student does want to go through that um, kind of hearing process that will result in disciplinary action or could result in disciplinary action, I can walk them through that process as well. Um, so it, students really have options when they come forward. Uh, the only times where we're, we as the college are obligated to do a full investigation is if there is a really serious concern about student safety, there was a very violent act committed. Those are times when even if the student doesn't necessarily want to pursue a full investigation, that the college is obligated to do so because we're now aware of this safety concern. In past conversation, because I am experienced of having I've been exposed to very strong female um, throughout my professional and personal uh, life, uh, I've heard a lot of such times, well, a few times to where they never knew that this would happen to them. And I've also witnessed um, and experienced how they were hesitant because of the negativities that they may face. Now, could you tell us about some of the experiences that may be negative that would keep a person from seeking help with you? And I think students um, or any victim of sexual misconduct that would be coming forward uh, might be concerned because they don't know what that process is going to look like. So they're scared that they might get themselves involved in a process that they're not comfortable with. Um, they might also fear retaliation exactly. if they don't know what, what parameters can be put in place to protect them. That's a huge fear that people have that I'm going to come forward and report and then it's going to get out that I reported and something bad will happen to me as a result of that. And we work very hard to protect victims that do come forward from retaliation. We work to keep that process as confidential as we can. One thing that I encourage students to do, and I'll, I'll turn this over to Megan um, Klein, is to talk with her office first, because Megan is a confidential reporter. So any reports that come to her office can stay in her office and not be reported out to my office. Um, so I'll let her speak to that. But I always encourage students to start there, learn about their options, and make an informed decision about how they want to move forward. Yeah, like Megan Peterson said, if students are coming to me, I'm mandated to only report certain things. Um, sexual assault is not one of them. So if a student comes to me and um, reports that there was an incident that happened, I don't have to go to her. I don't have to go to security and let them know that this situation occurred. I just work with that student on, okay, here's the situation. What do you want to do next? Here are your possible next steps you could take. I let them know about Megan's office. I let them know about, you know, the general reporting procedures they could go through. Um, but ultimately, it's going to be up to that student what they want to do next. I don't, you know, try and sway their decision in any way. I'm just pretty much there as a listening, supportive role. And it's their ultimate end decision what they want to do. I mean, what, out, what outside resources uh, would you redirect the student to? Because I bring this question up of if a person was to come up to you and they have a conversation with either one of you, uh, you sort of hit on it a little bit, Ms. Peterson, of I'm providing information for you that may become a conflict of interest to where you as the professional has to say, okay, I'm an ambassador and a protector of the students, but I am with Central Penn. Mm -hmm. I need to stop, where you, stop you in this conversation and redirect you because of the protection of your legal rights. Mm -hmm. Is there... Is there, a, one, is there a limit for that when they come to see you? And if there is or not, what other resources can they go, the individual, to find out more research, to talk to someone else to say, I need to make this step, and then take the necessary precautions? Yeah, so for me, if they're coming in my office, mm -hmm. they don't have to necessarily worry about me stopping them and saying, okay, if you say this information, mm -hmm. I can't keep that confidential. The only time that I would, I can even think of right now is if someone was saying something to me that I had to disclose would be if they were in danger. Like if they, maybe whoever the perpetrator was, if they are a violent person, maybe they're making threats on that person's life or they're threatening to hurt someone else, and especially if they're on that, this campus, mm -hmm. that's something that I can't keep to myself. And I would definitely let the student know that, that if anyone's life safety is in, in jeopardy, that that 
needs to be something that we do move forward with on reporting something, even if it's just concern. We don't have to necessarily say that this student had this situation happen to them and that's why we're reporting it, but we can just, there's other ways to go around it if that student doesn't want to come forward about their own personal incident. Uh, yeah, the point of conflict of interest with your agency, Ms. Peterson. Yeah, and what I would say for students coming to my office, if if a student is coming to my office, they likely have already decided that they want to do something about what happened to them. If a student were to come to my office and not want anything to happen, that would be somewhat rare, but that would be a case where I'd need to let the student know that I am you know, obligated to follow up with them. Um, and I think it's important for students to know that every employee on this campus, with the exception of Megan Klein, is considered a responsible employee and has to disclose to my office, at least, if a student tells them that they've experienced sexual misconduct. Um, Megan Klein's office is the only true confidential resource on campus. Um, we do also have confidential resources available through the YWCA of Carlisle. Um, they are the rape crisis center that covers um, our campus. So they also offer confidential resources and counseling um, if students wanted to seek that outside of our campus community. But in terms of um, anything that would be reported to any other college employee, including myself, um, I at least need to be reaching out to that student to talk them through what their rights and options are and then to do kind of a base level investigation to make sure that there's not an ongoing safety concern that we need to address. Okay. Now, the legal action, is it the responsibility if, you know, it's anyone thinking about responsibility when something of this magnitude has happened or has happened to them? So, like, do they need to go through you or can they go to um, the officials off campus? And that's completely up to the person that's experienced that um, act of sexual misconduct. If a student wants to come through my office and kind of try to handle something on campus, they can do that, but they can also reach out to um, the police or local authorities, or they can do both. It's really their decision. Pennsylvania, um, in order for police to be involved, the victim has to be the one to come forward. So there would not be a situation where I would call the police on behalf of a student and say, a student told me this, I need you to investigate it. The student needs to make that decision that they want to involve the police. We won't do that for the student. Now, if a student wants to do that and needs help and support through that process, my office can be there as a support to walk them through contacting the police and, you know, being there as an advocate for them. Um, but I would never contact the police without that student's wanting them involved. And I can see how that right there would deter an individual to go further. You know, like at this level, uh, this has happened to them. Okay. And then they're opening up, going, seeking counseling. And now you're telling me that you know, the victim, that in order to seek further action, I have to go here. I mean, that, that, that can be somewhat of a nightmare for an individual. Right, and that can certainly be a barrier if we're telling a student that came forward, um, you know, you have to go through this route now. Um, and so that's not what we want to do. We want the student to feel very empowered as they're going through the process, that they're being able to make those decisions about who they're notifying and what level of involvement they want from outside agencies, because we would never kind of go behind that student's back to involve an outside agency. Um, we'll be there as a support if they want them involved. Um, but in terms of if a student's coming to my office, I'll be talking to them about the scope of how I can help them on campus. Okay. And everything is very well like set up front so the students know what policies and procedures we have to follow, what the typical outlook of all that stuff is. So they, it's not like we're trying to hide anything or go behind their back like Megan said. Okay. And we try to be as transparent with possible yeah. students. Um, we have a, a student um, bill of rights that we go through with them where we kind of talk through all the different rights that they have under Title IX so that they understand what they're entitled to as they're going through this process and the options that they have. Um, so we try to be very upfront from the very beginning as soon as a student crosses, crosses the threshold of my office so that they know um, how we can help them and what the rights they're entitled to. Okay. For those of you listening, if you don't know, because I didn't know, and I probably don't know the numbers right now, but we don't have the specific numbers in front of me, but I would like to ask, in compared, as compared to all the colleges around here, we know sexual assault's happening in some fashion, whether it's reported or not reported. Now, I am a parent. I'm a parent of two daughters, and maybe this is why this is in the forefront more so for me of creating the PSA. Um, um, yes, I'm, other than my new dog now, I'm the only male in the house, <laughs> so at least I have some companionship. But um, what, as a parent, let's fast forward this, and, and my daughters are getting ready for college, and I still have this, you know, this concern in my head protecting, you know, my children. It's like, where can a parent find numbers, statistics, you know, where does Central Penn stand? What's going on on the campus of Central Penn? Where can I find that? 
Sure. So every college is required to disclose um, certain types of crimes. And one of the things that colleges are required to report are forcible sex crimes. Um, I talked back when we were talking about that continuum of sexual misconduct that rape or non-consensual sexual contact are considered forcible sex crimes, and they're something that is reportable. So any college will have those statistics available for the last three years. Anybody who wants to find them can find them on the Central Penn website, um, on either the public safety page or the Title IX page. Both have links to that PDF where students can see our statistics. Begin at every college is required to um, disclose those. And then you would ask kind of how Central Penn is stacking up with yeah. local colleges. And I think that's a really interesting question, one that I was kind of mulling over in my head. Um, when we think about the statistics um, that we of what we know is happening with sexual assault, we know that one in five women and one in 16 men um, are going likely to be sexually assaulted while they're in college. Um, whether they're reported or not is another story, but that's the numbers that you would expect. So when we're looking at the numbers that colleges are reporting, if you see low numbers or no numbers, it doesn't mean that sexual assault is not happening on that campus. It means that nobody feels comfortable reporting it on that campus, which is a very important distinction. So I looked at a handful of local colleges um, and just at their the numbers that they were reporting in 2016. There was one college that um, said that there were zero reports for 1,500 undergrads. Another that said that there were only two reports for close to 6,000 undergrad students. Um, and so when you look at those numbers, to me, I don't look at them and say, oh my word, that's such a safe campus. I look at those numbers and I say, people might not be feeling comfortable coming forward on that campus if they're experiencing sexual assault. Another local college had um, seven reports for 1,800 students. So that tells me that they're working really hard to create a culture where students do feel comfortable coming forward. Um, looking at our own statistics in 2016, which is the numbers that were just published um, on our annual security report, we had uh, th five cases come forward. And looking at, just kind of looking at the residential population, which I know is a small part of our um, community, but looking at that, since that's the population that we'd be most likely to probably hear reports from, um, looking at that male-female breakdown and the numbers that we have, I would expect about six reports a year um, coming forward just from our population. So the fact that we had five come forward in 2016 um, and we had another three in 2017 tells me that we're still low. Um, we're not completely off base from what's probably happening, but we probably are still being underreported even with the work that we're doing. Yeah, I would just reiterate exactly what Megan had said about when you see these numbers, I think people have an idea, maybe one year it was five and the next year say it's 15 and people think, oh my gosh, there's this crisis. Now there's these inc this huge increase in sexual assault cases and it's no, it's most likely these people are just reporting it more and they're feeling more comfortable about coming forward. So I think that's a good a good thing to keep in mind whenever we are looking at these statistics. And if they are in, seem, they, they do seem to be increasing or if the numbers are getting bigger, it's not necessarily that there's just more cases happening. It's just more people are feeling co confident and comfortable reporting it. And I know when the Title IX office was established here, um, one thing that I was very open with when I was hired into this position is that I hope to see those numbers increase in our reporting because it means that my office is doing its job of informing people about the process, informing people what their rights and options are, making people feel comfortable coming forward if they are experiencing an issue to know that there's an office that can help them. So I certainly want to see those reports come in because it means that people feel comfortable coming forward. Yep. And yeah, having some numbers you know, as a parent uh, would make the research a little bit better for me. I'm pretty sure with other people as mm -hmm. well. All right, folks, um, we've been talking about the sexual assault, sexual harassment issues here in our society, and uh, we're focusing on Central Penn. We'll be right back to continue the conversation. If you're listening in, um, I implore you to continue listening because we're going to talk about some topics that needs to be talked about. We'll be right back. This is Megan Rehm, Director of the Learning Center at Central Penn College. You can contact us at learningcenter at centralpenn.edu or find us on Facebook and Twitter as the Learning Center at Central Penn College. We are located in ATEC 302. We offer tutoring in math, writing, accounting, and IT, open during daytime hours and available during evenings and on Mondays as needed. We have online resources available through the Blackboard's Learning Center tab and online tutoring available for those who can't make it into campus. Hope to see you at the Learning Center. Mm -hmm. 
Welcome back, folks. This is Sada Youth Pinthong at the Nazir Harris Podcast Studio in Central Penn College. With me today, we're back with Megan Peterson and Megan Klein to talk about this issue that's going on right now about sexual assault and sexual harassment in our society today. Tell me about what's going on in the media. You know, we're all, you know, I'm a communicator. Social media is a big thing, and I've seen it. Not only if I'm a um, communicator, I'm a male figure. All right. Yes, I can't help to think, but come on, we have these key personnel, these like very important representative that are now representing, you know, my sex with uh, this sexual assault scar on them. Could you tell me about what's going on in the media today? I don't know if you wanted to talk about, on any of the, the campaigns that have been going on, Megan. Sure. So uh, as you touched on, um, there's been a lot of accusations coming forward against really famous male figures um, accusing them of sexual misconduct, whether that be assault or harassment. And it's really brought to light a larger conversation in our society about the prevalence of these behaviors. Um, I think specifically about the Me Too movement, um, which is something we had a great conversation on campus about earlier this week. But the Me Too movement was really aimed at um, showing how big of an issue this really is and how many women are impacted by sexual assault or sexual harassment or have experienced it personally. Going along with that, the Time's Up movement has been something really big in Hollywood. Um, about 300 women in the entertainment industry started this Time's Up movement to really seek equality in the workplace and environments that are free from harassment. Um, so those are the really big movements right now that are driving this conversation um, about the prevalence of sexual harassment and sexual assault. How about you, Ms. Klein? Yeah, I think, so besides the movements that are going on, my mind immediately goes to maybe some of movies or TV shows that might depict sexual assault uh, situations that are happening. And there are some that do a really good job of, of showing from start to finish what really happens. And I think there are other ones that do a lot of like the victim blaming that we sometimes see in society as to, you know, oh, well, what was this person doing before this incident happened? What were they, what, what were they dressed like? How did they, how are they acting kind of thing? So sometimes I think when we see these shows or movies, we get, some people get this idea like, oh, that's exactly how it goes. And that's just, that's the kind of the message they take with them throughout, you know, however long into the future. And I think that can really damage victims who actually have gone through this and come across these people with these really skewed ideas of what the trauma was that they went through. And so that sometimes can even re-traumatize a person who's having maybe a conversation with them and saying, almost like questioning themselves like, oh, is that really what happened to me? Is this how I should actually be feeling when all along maybe I was, you know, I don't know, feeling a completely different way. So I think it's the media can do some good things, but at the same time, it can really mess things up, too. And it's it's good to be mindful of, you know, both sides when we're seeing some stuff out there. Let me stay with you, Ms. Klein. And with that, it's like what as a person, let's say a friend, you know, a father, a parent, could you share with us what experiences a sexual assault victim may be going through? Yeah. So I think it, I mean, it's very different for everyone, depending on the person, the situation. I mean, some people might come out of that feeling very guilty and feeling a lot of shame for what just happened. Again, thinking that for some reason they were the cause of whatever happened. You might have someone who's just kind of in shock as to what's going on. They don't really know the resources that might be available to them. They don't know the the process of, okay, what can I do in this situation? Can I do anything? Um, someone might be feeling pretty helpless and feel like they can't do anything. Um, and then you might have other people who are very aware of the situation, what you know resources are available, what they maybe can do. And so I think it again, it's the spectrum of of how victims are kind of processing what might have happened to them. And I think it also depends a lot on, the support systems around them, if they even have a support system, that can make a big difference in how they cope and move forward from that incident, I think, too. Okay. Ms. Peterson, you want to add anything to that? I think Megan did a great job covering it. Yeah, I think every victim kind of approaches their experience differently. And I think it's also important to know that kind of going back to these Me Too movements, that some victims might just want their story to be heard and not want anybody else to do anything about it. Um, so giving people the space to feel heard and then let them decide from there where they want their story to go and not making the assumption that because somebody shared something with you that they want you to do something with that. Um, so I think just keeping that in mind as, 
if you're ever talking to someone who is a victim of sexual harassment or sexual assault, um, to let them lead where they want their story to go. Ms. Klein, um, throughout uh, the term, you, you, you help the students um, be able to maneuver through stressors and intentions throughout, the cl- uh, throughout their term. Are the, the identifying factors similar to stress? I mean, how would a person, a good friend, my friend's no longer talking, which they were, how can I know that something's wrong and it may be sexual assault? Or is it one of those things to where you just have to communicate with your friends or the person you're observing? Yeah, I mean, you might be, some people, you also have to remember, are really good at putting on that face and that front in public. So you might really not be able to get a sense that something traumatic has happened. Um, But for other people, it might just be something as, you know, maybe that person is isolating themselves more. Obviously, if this is your friend or your loved one, you know their personality, you know their typical behaviors, and if they're acting out of the ordinary, maybe there is something that happened. Can we, you know, is there a list of things that say, okay, if this is what they're exhibiting, then that's a a clear a clear sign that they were um, sexually assaulted or harassed. Not necessarily, but I mean, I think it can start a conversation that if you are noticing these differences in this person that you can definitely go up to them and say, hey, what's been going on? I've been noticing that, you know, maybe you're acting different or maybe they're not going to work. They're not going to class. You can like point out these behaviors that you're noticing and just use it as a a talking point. And if they want to open up and they want to say something that's been going on, then that's okay. If not, I mean, like Megan was saying, they might you know, maybe they do want to tell their story. Maybe they don't want to tell their story and you have to kind of meet them where they're at and respect them for whichever choice they, they choose if they want to share or not. Would there be an outcome, you know, of not releasing this? Yeah. Um, if for anyone who's gone through any kind of sexual assault trauma, the holding that in is one of probably the worst things you can do. Um, and I say this all the time to students who come in, not even who have gone through stuff like this, but just with general stress too, you hold this in and it starts, it, it doesn't go away. It's all, it's going to be there until you either tell someone your story or get, emo, you know, some kind of emotional outlet, something to release that. Um, because that's, that's a really, holding that trauma in is, can be super unhealthy and it's going to come out in some way, whether it's your emotions, your physical health, you know, some, somehow that it's going to show itself. And I'm pretty sure that would be um, the ripple effect that happens that the decisions that you make without talking to someone or releasing this. And I leave this, I mean, direct this to the both of you. It's like the residual fake effect out throughout your life can maybe possibly and I'm assuming this uh, cause you to make decisions that may not be conducive for what you truly want one of the things I think of in it from one of your questions earlier kind of sparked me thinking for both victim and perpetrator I think that especially for those who maybe have been a victim of a, a crime like this multiple times sometimes in it almost becomes like a norm for them So they get to a point where it's just, if it happened, oh, okay, this happened again. You know, it's like, I don't want to say it's not a big deal to them anymore, but they just get so accustomed to being used and, and, uh, hurt and then you have perpetrators who maybe are growing up I don't you know in a family life or maybe violence and this you know sexual assault is kind of maybe they've seen it before and it to them again that's their norm so for them to continue to do these crimes and you know act this way towards whether it's females or males I think sometimes in a way it can be a little bit of a learned behavior too so I think that's always something to as you're talking with people who maybe have gone through these situations more and more you start to hear some maybe like family history or friendship histories and it kind of starts to to click a little bit like okay this is maybe something that you aren't seeing as a problem you know what I mean it's just kind of there every day almost now why would you think that Hollywood and these key figures, these multi-million dollar icons, you know, lifestyle of the rich and famous that everyone, you know, likes to watch. How are they getting away with this? I think that has a lot to do with um, using their position of power, um, that they are 
in a position where they have either a, a role that someone wants or the ability to get them into the business that a person wants to be in. And they have this power over someone and they're leveraging that um, to kind of coerce people um, or to kind of take advantage of knowing that someone might not feel comfortable speaking up because they don't want to lose that job opportunity or be ostracized from this um, society or circle that they're trying to get into. Um, so oftentimes perpetrators, not just in Hollywood, but anywhere, will figure out how they can leverage their power to their advantage to silence the people that they're victimizing. Yeah, I mean, with a lot of sexual assault cases, I mean, a lot of the time it does come down to that power and control aspect. It has nothing maybe to do with the sexual piece, but it's more so having that control over someone else. And I, I wonder, too, if, if part of it is for these victims of of these higher up people and celebrities if it's well they're so high up on the totem pole almost that no one's going to believe me and you know who the, you, you see this person all the time out, out on in you know in the news and on movies and why would they believe this this person they've never even heard of before so i think that might play a role sometimes too with it yeah, and that was kind of shocking to me when all this started um, happening in the media to where these reputable, powerful, in, in their own respect, professional women are speaking out now, which goes to show even people that has the visibility that they do, do not come out. So um, I want to say to the listeners that every, I mean, there are people out there that are not talking. So it's very important to you know, this is something that I would want to say to my, my daughters repeated over and over. It's like, you can always come and talk to me, you know, just to unleash it and, and I can communicate. And you, you brought something up, and this is going to go towards the direction of the male figure. Because during the uh, Food for Thought meeting that happened on Central Pan, uh, Romeo Zanakan was um, a representative of, you know, on, the, on the board to talk about the male figure. Now, me personally, I was uh, raised by um, a Thai single mother. All right, so there's certain things, you know, we have the Asian culture and then single mother culture. So I've been nurtured and uh, raised and um, the mannerisms that I have towards female has, is due because of a female. And you mentioned consent, okay? Let's, can we elaborate just in case we don't, the people don't really know what that means? Because that may, be, that may sound like a, a silly statement to say. It's like, let's talk about what consent or the absence of consent means. So, I mean, consent is definitely something that we, me and Megan have done with our students before we've had conversations about this with presentations and uh, consent is giving a clear yes answer to whatever kind of action. Um, and one thing that students and not even just students, but anyone, anyone I've talked to sometimes they have this confusion with, well, but what if I get a head nod? What if he or she doesn't say no? They're, you know, they're still kind of, they're, they seem like they're into it. They're giving me these body signs. And I think that sometimes can be a big confuser for people because they see that and they think, oh, I don't have to ask because we're, you know, we're still doing whatever and everything's fine. So I think people don't think they need to hear that clear cut. Yes, I want to do this. No, I don't want to do this. Yeah, and the idea of consent is so important, too, that it has to be um, not just a clear yes, but a clear yes that there's no pressure associated with, that that person's not being coerced or pressured in any way to say yes. Um, that if you're kind of twisting someone's arm to say yes, do they really mean yes? Well, no, they don't. Um, so consent has to be clear and free from pressure. Um, and I think that's really important. Um, and sometimes when, when Megan and I are doing presentations, students will... Um, and not just students, but in the context of our job, students will say, well, I don't want to stop what I'm doing right in the middle and say, hey, are you okay with this? Mm -hmm. And consent doesn't have to be like that. Um, it's just checking in with your partner and um, making sure that they're okay and still enjoying the experience also. Um, so it doesn't need to be a, you know, stop everything that we're doing. We need to talk right now. It's just checking in throughout that experience to make sure that um, your partner is, is still on board with what you think mm -hmm. they're on board with. And just to you know, to, uh, to ask those questions, you know, in this, in, in this room, sexual assault is a crime, correct? Yes. Yes, yes it is. Yes. Unequivocally, yes. Uh -huh. Yes. Yeah, so in the state of Pennsylvania, no matter what culture you come from, the great, you know, United States of America, sexual assault is a crime. So with that, you might want to, you, you might be conducive for you, the individual, um, to take a minute, take a second, 
or continue the conversation to make sure that whatever event's about to transpire is a consensual. You're both on the same page. I'm not saying from like to hurry up and do that stuff, but you know it's better to know what you're doing before you find out that you accidentally did something and next thing you know you're faced with sexual assault charges. Because I think a lot of people don't know that their actions, because of the different cultures that we come from, are considered crude harassment and borderline sexual assault. So would either one of you want to elaborate based off of observations and you know whatever, whatever you can share for the listeners, what may be construed as sexual assault or harassment? Well, I think um, one thing that I think is important to touch on is if alcohol or other drugs are present in an encounter, um, that you might be, um, say you meet someone at a party, you guys are throwing back drinks, you think everything's going great, um, and you think they're on board, but if that person is intoxicated, um, they may be agreeing to something, but they don't have the mental capacity in that moment to give consent. Um, So I always caution people to be very, very careful when drugs or alcohol are involved because you don't know what a person's level of intoxication is, what their tolerance is, to know if they're able to give consent in that moment. So I think that's something that's important to touch on. And then um, other kind of normalized behaviors that may actually fall in that sexual misconduct continuum, um, I think is coercive behaviors that somebody may think, oh, well, this person's just playing hard to get. So I'm going to keep going after them and keep going after them and keep pressuring them. And eventually that person gives in. I mean, that's such a normalized behavior. But and, and that social person, media doesn't help. Social media, media doesn't does help. help. Mm-hmm. Movies don't help. Songs don't help. Um, it's so normalized that um, it's just the idea of playing hard to get or no doesn't mean no. It means persuade me mm-hmm. when no means no. And if a person says no, you need to stop. Um, so I think that's another very normalized behavior that could fall into that continuum of coercive sexual contact, ca- contact which is a problem. Yeah, I was going to speak to the, the alcohol and, and drugs other piece because before uh, Megan got into her position, I was kind of the lead in, in doing Title IX stuff, um, presentations with the students, and that was always a big shocker for students was when I would bring up the alcohol and drugs and that you can be charged even if in the, the heat of the moment you guys are good, both people agreed, the next night or the next day someone wakes up and says, no, that's not what I wanted, and they were shocked and they couldn't understand that being under the influence you are not able to to give that sound judgment call and say, yes, this is what I want. No, this is not what I want. So that I think was, that's still a big piece, not just for the students, but I mean, other, a lot of people I think were, are probably can be confused by that too. And, and you hear it all the time. Well, I know how I am when I, when I'm under the influence of something, you know, I can control myself. I'm good. And it's, no, you're really not. So it, that's always something I think, especially here on campus, we try to push home to students Um, So that way we don't see them getting into some serious trouble down the line. Mm -hmm. And even if a student says, I know how I am under the influence, well, that's great for you, but you don't know how your partner is under the influence. So you can't assume that because I had one or two beers, I'm fine. You don't know that your partner can handle that the same way. And so being very cognizant that just because that's your experience, if you're consuming alcohol or drugs, that it may not be the same experience for somebody else. Thank you. That's, that's, I think that's very important for our listeners to, uh, to hear. Now, we've heard you know, that sexual assault is illegal. So no matter what, where you come from, it's illegal. And there's actions that are unacceptable. Um, if you would indulge me uh, in regards to sexual assault, sexual harassment being the outcome of an action taking, maybe the removal, removal of power from the victim. Now, with that understanding that why does an individual when i say individual statistically speaking are there more males committing sexual assault sexual harassment one statistically speaking yes Mm, okay so and with that why are these men from the male figure you know like i said romeo zanacan brought this up and um i was raised by a single mother and there's certain things that just doesn't jive with me it's like why would you treat um an individual or a woman this way um, why would a person feel the need to commit an act like this? No, I mean, I don't know if we have facts to this, if we can leave it alone. Uh, is this their social? Could we say that it's, you know, I know this is one of those sticky situations because I know what I want to say. Um, it's like, you don't do that. You know, you, it's not a man shouldn't do that. You just should not do that. It's wrong, you know, uh, but 
would you want to do this to your daughter? You know, would you want your mother to know to do this? You know, it's a very sticky situation, but this is what this is. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And I can't speak to what would prompt like a single individual, but I can kind of talk to um, societal things mm-hmm. or factors that may be influencing these behaviors um, and may kind of go to people not realizing that their behaviors are falling on this continuum of sexual misconduct or realizing that what they're doing is wrong. Um, and I think one of it, it goes back to that idea that I've said that of playing hard to get that um, it's the man's job to convince the woman that, um, you know, she is realized that she's actually into him or to be that pursuer. Um, and we, what we don't see normalized in our society is um, men stopping when they're told. If you look um, at the plot of pretty much every romantic comedy, um, it's a man pursuing a woman relentlessly even after she says she's not interested. And then they have a happy ending when in reality, that's not generally how things work. But we've normalized that behavior that you're supposed to keep pressuring and keep pressuring and keep pressuring. Um, and I think that that's something that has made it seem OK to do that. Um, one other thing that I'll touch on is uh, I think we raise our men and our women differently. Um, the idea that the conversations that you would have with your daughters may be different than conversations that you would have with your sons. You don't hear many people telling their sons, you can't go out dressed like that, but they'll tell their daughters, you need to dress you know, more modestly. Um, and that kind of goes to the idea that it's a woman's job to make sure that she's not assaulted. To make sure that her actions are protecting herself because if she gets assaulted, it's because of something she did wrong. When that needs to be the complete opposite of what we're teaching people is that you respect someone and you don't assault them. It doesn't matter what they're wearing or what they're doing. And we need to make those conversations more equitable um, with our children um, so that we're not raising um, men who think that they're entitled to pursue someone and women who think it's their job to make sure they're not assaulted. Thank you, Ms. Klein. The, she said a lot of, of good points. Um, that I was thinking as she was saying them. So I don't know that I have any, anything else to add. I think it, it, there are definitely a lot of different factors. It's hard to just stick to one point and say this, this is the sole reason why someone would do this. There's, there's a lot of different factors. It's hard to, yeah, I think think (laughs) we'll save that one for another uh, interesting podcast because to me, it is very important to sit there and possibly dissect on a very basic construct of why people do the things that they do for like this one sexual assault and sexual harassment. Listeners, despite, like I said before, despite what you may agree, what you may not agree, where you're from, what country you're from, you sit in the house with no shoes on. Um, My experience, I've traveled all over the world and been in many situations uh, here. It is not acceptable. No, it's 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 not acceptable. There's no room for it, and there sh- shouldn't be a reason for anyone to remove the power from any one particular individual and make them feel belittled in a sexual assault, sexual harassment environment. So, in closing comments, it's like, uh, Ms. Peterson, is there anything you want to add to the listeners? Um, I do think it's important to add. I know we focused a lot on um, kind of sexual assault and sexual harassment between men and women, mm-hmm. um, but I think it's important that Um, We recognize that anyone can be a victim, um, that men are also victims. Folks that don't identify on the gender binary um, are actually at a much greater risk of becoming a victim of sexual harassment or sexual assault. So making sure that um, those voices are included in the conversation and that those folks know that there's help available for them also and that they shouldn't feel that their experiences are in any way silenced because um, the majority conversation has focused on this male-female dynamic. And Ms. Klein? Yeah, my closing comments would have to be um, for anyone who has gone through a, a sexual assault, has been a victim of this, for the friends of these people who um, maybe do come forward with their story and, and tell a friend or family member that this just happened to them, just some tips for, for these people who are hearing these stories be supportive, even if you don't understand, even though if you have a lot of questions about the situation, don't interrogate them. Don't try and figure out what happened, why it happened. Just be there for them and listen to them and let them know that you're there and that you are going to help them however they might need, whether that's just being there for them to talk to you or if you actually maybe want to go to the hospital they'll take you to the hospital if you want to go to the cops that will let's go to the cops you know don't feel like you have to figure out what to do for them because it's their choice and if this just happened they're going to be pretty traumatized they're going to need time to process what happened so just be there to listen but 
you know, um, just whatever they want to do in that moment, be there in that moment with them and support them and let them know that they're being supported. Because after this happens, nine times out of 10, the person's going to feel very shameful and guilty and in a awful, awful place emotionally. And so the last thing they need is, is someone critiquing them and trying to dig out all the, the nitty gritty details of what happened. Um, so just, just be aware of that and don't, obviously do not blame them in any way shape or form if they came from a party if they were you know again we've said this already the whole time here if they're dressed a certain way just be there and listen because I think we lose track of how we can help and sometimes it is just being there as a support person so that would be my guidance thank you Mm ma'am miss Klein how can any um how can anyone reach you if they're seeking information so on campus my office is upstairs in bollinger hall in room 57 so if they want to drop by they can um, send me an email at megan klein at centralpen.edu or counselor at centralpen.edu both of them go right to me um, if they you know email is usually the quickest way to get in touch with me especially if it's late at night or on the weekends i get it right at my phone um, or they can call my office number at 717-728-2416. So lots of different ways to get in touch with me. Okay. And for you, Ms. Peterson? If students need to get a hold of me, my office is on the top floor of ATEC. I'm in ATEC 305. I can also be reached at Megan Peterson at centralpen.edu. Again, those emails go to my phone as well. It's a great way to get a hold of me. Uh, my office number is 717-728-2398. Um, and students can reach me in any of those ways. Well, thank you very much, ladies, for joining me today here. Uh, I appreciate your time. Um, There's a lot of information that we provided for the listeners, and, of course, there's a lot more information that uh, we didn't have the time to talk about today. Uh, But this this issue is an ongoing issue, listeners, and uh, you need to take action, uh, find the research, and be aware of what's going on. Be vigilant of what's going on out there because you might be around people that you don't even know. And for those listening, if you don't know, you know, find out. You know, it reminds me of a song, if you don't know, now you know based off of what you're listening for today. But um, I do appreciate if you're still listening to us right now, uh, sticking with us and talking about and listening to this um, topic of discussion that it's uh, it is something that needs to be heard. And with that, on behalf of Megan Peterson and Megan Klein, <laughs> two Megans in the same thing, um, I'm Sadi Pinthong with the Nightly News Podcast. And uh, get involved so you can evolve, students. Mm-hmm.